if we want to be around, if we want to be married to the same person that we're married to now, if we want to still have our kids talking to us when they're adults, um, if we still want to be doing work that we're satisfied with, if we still want to be in good health, then we got to focus now and kind of start with the end in mind. Helping you design your roadmap to wholeness from the inside out. This is Win Today. And now, here's your host, Christopher Cook. Hey friends, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for tuning in this week. Welcome to episode 241, where this week we're talking about how to free yourself from the cult of overwork. In a recent survey of workers, 82% of the respondents said they're overworked. And obviously, this has resulted in extremely high burnout rates. Get this, in the United States alone, 43% of the respondents indicated that staff morale was low because they are overworked. And to make matters more complicated, almost half or 49% have left their company because they felt overwhelmed by the amount of work. You see, not only is overworking detrimental to long-term wellness, it is addictive. And too many people wrap their overall self-worth and identity in their performance. I've been there. I'm raising my hand right now. And to be honest, I'm probably still there a little bit. But what if there was another way, friends? Like, what if you could learn to win at work and succeed at life? Well, you can, and that is exactly the conversation we're having today with New York Times bestselling author and leadership development expert, Michael Hyatt. But really quickly, before we head into our conversation with Michael, if you're enjoying the podcast, share it. Send a text to a friend, to a family member right now, and invite them to listen as well. And then rate and review the podcast wherever you're listening. I know I ask you to do this every week, but it really matters. Here's why. When you rate, review, and share the podcast, the listenership grows. Simple as that. Guys, thanks for listening and for doing just that. Right now, here's my conversation with New York Times bestselling author, the one, the only, Michael Hyatt. Enjoy and take a lot of notes. Michael, welcome back to the podcast. I'm absolutely thrilled to have you today. Thanks, man. Great to be with you. Good to see you. Likewise. It's the third time you've been on Win today. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. I didn't realize it'd been that many times. Well, and, cool. and, and the funny part is that the last time you and I spoke was two weeks before shutdown last year, 2020. Man, what a year it's been. It feels like it's been a decade. Yes, it does. And you know what? What a great place to start this conversation. Uh, Michael, catch us up. What's been happening with you with the business. I know a lot of transition has happened amidst 2020 in this pandemic, but I'd love to start there before we dive in. Yeah. So like I was in the middle of leading our business accelerator coaching clients through their quarterly sessions. So we have these business coaching clients that come in once a quarter. And before COVID, they would come in in groups of 50 and they'd spend the entire day with me. And then I'd go through like nine or 10 days of that in a row. So we were kind of at the ed- end of that sequence in March and it was my second to last group. And the president spoke the night before and said that, you know, we're going to go into this two week lockdown to flatten the curve. And so I had, you know, 50 people in a room who were pretty panicked, you know, like, what does this really mean and what's going to happen to the economy? So we completely pivoted in terms of our content And uh, so I taught a whole day on leading through crisis because Mm. I had led through the Great Recession when I was the CEO of Thomas Nelson Publishers. So I I just shared with them some things that had been helpful to me in leading through that crisis. That turned into a course called Leading Through Crisis that we published a week later. It was a full blown course. And so that was awesome. Uh, About two weeks into the pandemic, we realized that with as many young parents as we have working for us, that suddenly they didn't have daycare. They didn't have childcare. They had their kids underfoot. They were trying to, you know, work and give us the time that, that, that we needed, but they just were struggling to do it. So we said, look, as an experiment, let's go to a six hour work day. Hmm. We're not going to dock anybody's pay. We're going to pay everybody the same amount, but we're going to go to a six hour work day and just see if we can maintain our level of productivity and still hit our financial forecasts. So for two weeks, that worked fantastic. Then we said, well, let's try it through the summer. So we went all the way through the summer with a 30-hour work week. That worked fantastic. The company was doing better than it had ever done before. And so then we decided to make that uh, permanent. 
which is a little bit counterintuitive because you think in order to get more, you got to work more, right? You got to work harder. You got to work more. That's, you know, that's kind of what everybody believes in America today and really around, around the world. So we shortened the hours and we ended up finishing the year 101% ahead of the prior year in terms of our profitability and 52% ahead of our budget, which had already been pretty aggressive compared to the prior year. So we made this a, a permanent feature. And then the final thing yeah. uh, is that I stepped uh, down as the CEO of the company in on January the 2nd and turned over the reins to my daughter, Megan. She's my oldest daughter. And uh, so she's been the CEO. I've stepped back. I'm the chairman and the founder now. And I'm working three days a week. And I'm loving it. Oh. Uh. Good for you. That's awesome. I mean, you you are the epitome of winning at work and succeeding at life. So congratulations on that. Thank you. Well, I, I do believe in that that message and I do believe I've got to live it. You know, yeah. if I'm going to preach it, I got to live it first. It's so true. And Michael, I, I love the strategic part of our conversations. And yet today, I think I want to start as we head into this topic, I want to start by asking you to wind back the clock a little bit and talk about a hard moment with Gail. You talked about it in the book. You just received a huge bonus at work, but it wasn't met with a smile at home. What happened? Yeah. So what happened was that I had taken over this one division for Thomas Nelson Publishers. At that time, they had 14 different book publishing divisions. Our book publishing division, Nelson Books, was dead last in every significant financial metric. <laughs> you know, we were shrinking, not growing. We were the least profitable. In fact, we'd lost money the previous year. The employee morale was terrible in our division. So I was given responsibilities, the general manager for this division, and the CEO said, how long is it going to take you to turn it around? And I just you know, pulled a number out of the air, and I said, I think it's going to take about three years. And he said, well, that's kind of what I was thinking, so have at it. So I got pretty clear on the vision for where I wanted that division to be over three years. I went back and shared it with the team. We all rolled up our sleeves, and we got to work. And, I mean, we – sacrificed weekends, nights, we were traveling like crazy, but we turned it around. So in 18 months, not three years, but in a year and a half, we went from 14 to number one in terms of we were the fastest growing division. We were the most profitable division. And as you mentioned, I got the biggest bonus check I'd ever received in my life. It was more than my annual salary. I was over the moon and I expected that Gail, my wife, would be too. So I bounced into the to the house and unfurled this check. And I said, mm. what do you think? <laughs> and she was just a little less enthusiastic than I expected her to be or that she typically was because she's always been my greatest cheerleader. She said, honey, we need to talk. And I went, uh-oh. Mm -hmm. So we walked into the den. We sat down. Uh, she began to tear up and she said, you know, I love you. And I'm so grateful for all that you do for our family. But I got to be honest with you. She said, babe, you are never at home. And she said, even when you are, it's like you're not here. You know, you're somewhere else. And your five daughters need you at this moment, you know, in, in their lives more than ever. And then she began to cry. And she said, if I'm honest, I feel like a single mom. And so... Chris, I thought I had reached the pinnacle of success, but what I discovered was that it was a false summit. Hmm. And it was devastating. Personally. You said in your book, and, and I think there are a lot of people listening right now, Michael, who are saying, yep, I've been there, or I can feel the wheels turning in such a way that I may be headed, the ship's headed in that direction. And you made this statement in the book, and I think we can spring off of your your story that's this, neglect in one area of life often signals neglect in others. Can you teach that out even through the framework of, of your story? Yeah, so one of the things we cover in the book, When It Work and Succeed at Life, is that life is multidimensional. So just to back up for just a minute, the subtitle of the book is, is basically five principles to free yourself from the cult of overwork. And so we do have a cult. We have an epidemic of overwork in our country. And it's wreaking havoc in people's lives. And it's largely because people think that life consists of one dimension. You know, it's work. It's total work. And this whole problem is being promoted by and exacerbated by sort of celebrity entrepreneurs who talk about what we say in the book is we call the hustle fallacy, mm -hmm. where if you just hustle more, you know, you'll get ahead. And someday 
you'll be able to give attention to those area, other areas of your life. But for now, in terms of just practically how you operate, work is it. Work is the totality of life. But one of those five principles that Megan and I write about in When at Work, and, and I wrote this with my oldest daughter, who's now the CEO, as I mentioned, is that, is that life is multidimensional. You know, life is not just work. And it can feel like that sometimes. And we can delude ourselves into thinking it's just that. Yeah. But it's more than that. Life consists of, you know, our spiritual life, our intellectual life, our emotional life, our physical life, our finances, our hobbies, um, our relationship with our family, with our friends. All these things are a part of it. And it's not just that life is multidimensional. It's, a, it's, it's also that these different domains of life interact with one another. They're, they're interrelated. Mm -hmm. So that if, for example, I experience a health crisis, that can back up into my work. You know, I may not be able to work or I may not have the energy for work or I may not have the focus because I'm distracted by my health. Conversely, if we're experien experiencing stress at work, that can back up into our most important relationships where we're short you know, with the people that we, that we love, or we say unkind things, or, or mm -hmm. we just neglect them. So all these things fit together and work together. So when you recognize this, and even to spring off the conversation you and Gail had in the den at your home, she's crying. If you were to peel the layers of the onion back to get down to the root issue to begin to make a change, where did you start? Yeah, this, and this is another principle that we talk in about the book, which is the power of constraints. So mm -hmm. one of the first things I did, Chris, was I hired an executive coach because I, I, I kind of felt lost. You know, I felt like I was, you know, reasonably competent at work. I just come off this huge victory and I felt great about that. But I thought, man, I, I don't know what I'm doing mm -hmm. in the rest of my life. I knew I was out of shape, for example, that I'd been on the road eating junk food like a lot of road warriors do. And I hadn't been exercising regularly, I, really not at all. You know, and I was kind of at that age where I, I you know, kind of felt immortal, immortal, but I knew it was going to catch up with me. So I said, I got I to gotta have some accountability. I've got to have a coach. So I hired Daniel Harkavy, with whom I wrote my book, Living Forward on Life Planning. And the first session, Daniel said to me, he said, you know, you seem to be a guy that doesn't have any boundaries when it comes to work. And he said, tell me if I'm right or wrong. But he said... My guess is that the middle of the afternoon, when you kind of figure out that you're not going to finish your task list by the end of the day, you, you say to yourself, no problem. I'll go home, have a quick bite with the family. Then I'll flip open the laptop and I'll continue working. Well, he was spot on. Mm. And then he said, my guess is that on the weekends, if you haven't finished your work by the end, end of the day on Friday, you say, no problem. I'll just do this Saturday morning or I'll do it Sunday afternoon but you work on the weekends, true or false. And I said, you know, again, you're spot on. And he said, my guess is when you take a vacation, if you take a vacation, that you drag work into your vacation. You get up before the rest of the family. Yeah. You work on that project that you haven't had time to get to. And I said, you're, you're exactly right. That's, that's me. And he said, okay, let's put some constraints in place so that work doesn't take over your life because the only difference between a swamp and a river is that a river has banks. It has boundaries. And so I said, okay. So he said, when are you willing to quit? And I mean, shut your laptop and not open it until the next morning. And I said, I'm willing to commit to doing that at 6 p.m. Okay. Now I do it a lot earlier than that today. Yeah. But that was a huge step for me back then. And I said, I'm not, I, I won't work on the weekends. And I commit to you that I won't work on my vacations. Now here was the kicker. He said to me, okay, Awesome. He said that I'm sure you won't mind if I occasionally call Gail, your wife, and check, a, check in with her on how you're doing. Now, all of a sudden, it got real. So, so literally, uh. like every 30 days or so, once a quarter at the minimum, he would call Gail and he would say, how's Michael doing? So I, I could run, but I couldn't hide. You know, I, right. had to, I had to be – I knew that accountability was coming. <laughs> But that changed everything for me, Chris, because here's what happened. The, the thing that people don't often realize about constraints is that they really do create the freedom that we all crave hmm. because they force you to prioritize and make better decisions. 
Hmm. Now, let me illustrate. We all know this because we know that the most productive day that we spend all year long is the Friday before we leave on Saturday for a one-week vacation. We are like hyper-focused. We're not distracted. We knock out the work, and we've never been more productive. Now, that's the power of constraints. And if we apply that every day, you know, if we have a, a, a hard boundary in terms of when we're going to stop work, it forces us to get hyper-focused, it keeps us from getting distracted, and we just make better decisions. And the truth is, not all work is created equal. You know, one of the things I advocate with our, with our Full Focus Planner, which is a tool that we publish for entrepreneurs and other leaders, is to, is to identify your big three daily tasks mm-hmm. every day. Because not all work is created equal. You know, the average person has about 15 tasks on their to-do list. So if 20% drives 80% of the results, which is the Pareto principle, then three of those tasks are going to be the important ones. So why not just identify those and make sure you knock those out and declare a win if you do? Hmm. Make sense? It really does. And I'm hearing this story and I'm hearing the reality of, of the breakdown of what can happen because we're not, we can't necessarily compartmentalize the domains of life as easily as we think we can. And Michael, I think one of the things for me that, that, that I'm going, oh no, is how many of us guys, how many of us listening right now are dealing with not only the hustle fallacy, but the immortality fallacy. And Michael, this is a huge wake up call because what I heard you say is there's no way that overwork and just grinding and grinding and grinding is going to do any good in the long term. It's really true. And I think, you know, kind of to the immortal fallacy, we have to recognize that, that this hopefully, you know, is a marathon that, that if we want to, if we want to be around, if we want to be married to the same person that we're married to now, and I've been married for almost 43 years. Yeah. If we want to still have our kids talking to us when they're adults, um, if we still want to be doing work that we're satisfied with, if we still want to be in good health so that that's not, you know, something we spend an inordinate amount of time trying to remediate, then we've got to focus now and kind of start with the end in mind. What is it that we want in 20, 30, 40 years and give attention to those, to those details now? And one of the things that that happened to me is, is, you know, self-deception is a, is a big problem. I mean, yeah. it's a real thing. Yeah. And, and I think I kidded myself for years, you know, lied to myself for years that my situation was temporary. And, and here was the conversation in my head. I would say to myself, you know, I just started a new job. And once I get acclimated to this job, you know, get kind of settled in, then I can give Gail and the girls the time and attention they deserve. And then somebody would resign on my team and now I'm doing two jobs. And so then I'd say to myself and I'd say to Gail, I'd say, look, you know, I've got a vacancy here, a major vacancy. As soon as I get this person hired and onboarded, I'll give you the time and attention that you deserve. And, you know, along with the girls, and then it would be something else. And then it would be something else. So what I thought was a temporary situation that would end bled into another temporary situation that bled into another temporary situation and before long, what looked like it was temporary became a permanent way of life. And at some point, you've got to interrupt the pattern. You've got to break the cycle. You've got to decide, hey, I'm going to do something different because the trajectory of this is not headed in the right direction. How did the girls and Gail's feedback to you, what did it look like, actually, I should say, when you started to get healthier, when you started to win at work, succeed in life, as we're talking about today, what was their feedback like toward you? In, in the relationship? Well, super encouraging. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I, I lay that at, you know, the credit for that goes to my wife, Gail, because, you know, positivity is her number one strength on strength finders. You know, she's, she's one of those people that's always giving other people the benefit of the doubt. She rarely complains. Um, she's just an amazing human, mm-hmm. but she was super encouraging to me. You know, it doesn't take much. And I think, I think that's the thing that, that, that a lot of people don't realize is that, and, and this isn't original with me, but somebody said, you know, how do you spell love? T-I-M-E. You know, it's time. Mm-hmm. And so part of what 
happens when you decide to impose constraints on your work is that it frees you up to pursue the other domains of your life. But here's the problem. Unless we're intentional with that time, then we'll drift right back to work. Now, why is that the case? Why is work so stinking seductive? Well, think about it. Work is the place where we feel competent, right? I mean, most of us, you know, we've been in our profession for any length of time. That's the place where we kind of know what we're doing. Not so much when it comes to our marriages or our kids. You know, that's kind of uncharted territory. Most of us didn't get training and it's hard to see progress. Mm -hmm. You know, at work, you see progress. You know, you, you, you're completing projects, you're checking things off your to-do list. And we know from the research on happiness that happiness comes from making steady progress on significant goals. You don't usually face that at home, though. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, it's much more difficult to get, you know, the positive feedback that lets you know you're doing a good job. Kids are a long-term project. You know, you don't know what you got till you know, 20 years into the process. So, um, so it's, it's easy to drift back to work unless we have a, a plan. And so what I tried to do was simple things like scheduling date night with Gail. Or scheduling time with the kids. And this here's a huge one for me. The weekends, the reason I drifted back into work, I didn't know what else to do with myself. And I'm not the kind of person that can just be idle. So I just start taking up hobbies and start, you know, getting aggressive about, you know, learning about different things so that I could fill up that time with things that were other than work. And the beautiful thing was it made me a better employee. It made me a better leader. Because now Uh I was rest rejuvenated. One of the things that is difficult for me to strike a balance between is this achievement and ambitious drive. Sometimes I confuse it for this is just me being diligent and faithful to the call of God on my life. And most of the people here follow Jesus. And so how do you think, number one, we know the difference between ambition and diligence and faithfulness. And then like, when does that strength of achiever, because it is a strength. Any strength overextended becomes a liability in the long run. How do we know the difference and how do we, how do we make sure we're not overextending that strength? Well, I think, I think part of it is constraints, which we've talked about, you know, so that you, you've got room in your life for everything else. Now, one of the things that Megan and I advocate for in Win at Work and Succeed at Life is the whole idea of work-life balance, which, you know, a lot of people today, it's very popular to say that it's a myth. There's no such thing. But a lot of it depends on how you define it. And so for me, work-life balance means that I'm giving the appropriate time and attention to each of the various domains in my life. So for example, I will, I'm, I do a six hour work day. I'm working six hours today as we're recording this. I spent an hour, uh, working out this morning. First thing. Okay. So I don't need to work out six hours. You know, like I'm working six hours. No, I just need to give an appropriate amount of time and attention to the physical domain of my life so that I stay healthy. You know, about an hour a day is, is plenty. Um, you know, time with my marriage. I spend more time at work than I spend on my marriage. I mean, that's just the, kind of the nature of work. But that's okay. You know, I'm in balance. I'm given an appropriate amount of time. But I think for me to answer your specific question, Chris, I think it, 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 it's helpful to have a set of priorities and literally write them down. Mm. And so example, my number one priority is God. And, you know, that's, that's not usually something I can just check off as accomplished, you know, like most relational kinds of things. That means I've got to spend time with Jesus, you know? So for me, that looks like in the morning, you know, that I'm giving him my first and best time. You know, I start each morning reading the scriptures. I pray, I journal, I meditate, then I hit the gym. My second priority is, and, and a lot of people get confused at this point is they say, well, then I guess my, you know, maybe my spouse comes second or my kids come next or whatever. But for me, it's me. I am the second priority. Now here's the rationale. I don't think it's because I'm selfish, although I certainly struggle with that. I don't think it's because I'm narcissistic, though I probably have tendencies toward that, but it's because I want to serve And I can't serve other people if I'm sick or if I'm distracted or if I'm not emotionally healthy. 
And so I've got to give attention to myself, just, just like when they exhort us, you know, on the airplane flights to, you know, in, in the case that there's a loss in cabin pressure, put your own mask on before you try to help anybody else. Right. And so, uh, and so I think you've got to do that. Then comes after me, then comes Gail, then comes my kids, then comes my work, then comes church and all the other stuff. Now, I don't know how many people you have that listen to this that are in ministry, but people that are in ministry have to be particularly careful. Uh, I think the, the, the devil loves to confuse people on this. And a lot of people put their ministry as number two, you know, God first ministry, second, everything else comes behind that. That's a recipe for having no ministry in 10 years. And I've seen it time and time again. It's really sobering. And I hope everyone heard what Michael just said there. Uh, Michael, this is perhaps a little rhetorical, but I, I want to drill this point home for people. What's at the foundation, like the core foundation, the principle, the mindset paradigm of winning at work and succeeding in life? What builds the house, so to speak? We're, we're building from this. Yeah, you know, I, that's, first of all, that's a, it's a great question. I don't think I've ever been asked it, but I do have an answer. My fundamental worldview that informs everything, and we just teased this out with our executive team this last summer, sort of the fundamental foundational number one value is stewardship. And so I believe that my life, my time, my money, you know, my, my talents, such as they are, that God's giving these to me as a stewardship. I can't, you know, bury these. I have to invest them. I have to, to realize their potential. Just like it says in Matthew 25, you know, that, that I've been given these talents and the Lord of the harvest expects a return. That's right. And so the, the full scope of that stewardship is that I've, I just haven't been given an asset, but I've been given a portfolio of assets. And I have to manage that entire portfolio, which is my life. So my kids are an asset for which I'll give an account. My wife is an asset that I have to give an account for. How I, how I treat her, how I care for her, how I nurture her, how I help her become all that she can be. You know, that's part of my stewardship. My health, you know, is an asset that God's given me that I have to steward well. My relationship with Christ, all that stuff. So stewardship, I think, is the short answer to the question. That's, that's so helpful, Michael. I want to go back to the double win, and there are five key principles you talked about in the book. Will you tease each one of those? Yeah, but so the, the, we talked about constraints already, right, as one of them. We've talked about the fact that life is multidimensional. Uh, we talked about the fact that work-life balance is not a myth. Um, another one is just the value of non-achievement. Yeah, so this... For guys like you and guys like me, for whom achievement is everything, that's tough because, you know, I've been known, and I bet there are people listening to this podcast, to this on YouTube that have had this before. I've been known to write down things on my to-do list after I've done them just to check them off. That's how much I like achievement. <laughs> I do too. <laughs> but but <they're> <laughs> Because our, because our whole identity gets wrapped up in achievement. Yeah. You know, but there's some things that are extraordinarily valuable that aren't measured by achievement, like the quality of your relationships. Mm -hmm. You know, let's just start with our relationship with God. Yeah. You know, we could probably turn that into some kind of an achievement thing, but I don't think it's healthy. You know, it's quality time. I think, you know, hobbies. Yes. You know, I've, I've pursued several different hobbies over the course, uh, course of the last, you know, two decades. You know, one of my favorites is fishing ah. and just to be out on the water. And somebody said to me one time, they said, the great thing about fishing is you're doing something, but you ain't doing much. And that's what I love about fishing. Um, I've, you know, I'm kind of musical. And so I've in recent years, in the last five years, I've taken up playing the native American flute and just to sit outside, sit on my dock, you know, play the Native American flute is not achievement, but it's so rejuvenating. Uh, spending time with friends. Like last night, we went to dinner with some of our best friends and had a great time together. And that was non-achievement time. It was just time 
relating to one another and, and building our relationship. And so I think that, that we tend to devalue in our culture today, yeah. Yeah. we tend to devalue this non-achievement time. And I would say that's the very thing that gives our life depth, richness, and texture. And, and we've got to pursue it if we're going to have a meaningful life and if we're not going to burn out and if we're going to go the distance. I have to stay there for another minute because my heart is beating quickly right now because it makes me a little anxious to hear it. Number two, it gets me really excited because Michael, and I, I don't want to wax philosophically here, but I'd like to propose that there's a chance that you settling into a level of non-achievement actually makes the tasks, the, the dreams, the initiatives richer, more succinct, yep. more effective. You know, it, it's like, as I had shared with you, I just signed this agency contract and so I'm working on my first book and the best ideas for the book have come in the shower when I'm folding laundry, when I'm just enjoying my life and I'm realizing this message is settling within my physiology. I know that sounds a little woo woo to a lot of people watching us right now. I'm going, Chris, what are you doing? I'm just saying, I think there's something to that. Am I wrong with that proposal? Like it actually makes you more successful. Yeah, totally it does. Because here's the thing we know, and, and all the research proves this. And by the way, this leads kind of a little bit into the fifth principle. Um, yeah, which is rest is the foundation of meaningful, productive work. And so I think that there's a way of thinking, and I certainly was guilty of this for you know the first half of my career, and that is that I thought that rest was a reward for all my hard work. You know, so I'd say, okay. I'll take the weekend off if I get my work done or I'll take that vacation, you know, if I can accomplish this major goal. And what I discovered in all the, the research about rest, and this is documented in the book, is that rest and also this non-achievement time is the foundation for greater cre creativity, um, more focused work, greater productivity. Because think of it this way, when you're rested, you're more focused. Yes. When you're rest, yes. you're more creative. When you're relaxed, you're more creative. I mean, some of the best ideas I've ever had business ideas happen when you're in the shower, you're taking a walk. And one of the things we know from sports is that stress or tension is the enemy of performance. And so if you don't build into your life those opportunities to rest and rejuvenate, you're simply not going to be as productive uh, or as focused or as creative as you otherwise could be. Mm. That's really helpful. Well, Michael, thinking about my generation uh, and even Gen Z who are now graduating college and stepping into the workforce, I know many people who take less money for more flexibility and options. Do you think that value is sweeping all sectors of work or is it a, just a generational thing? I don't know that it's a generational thing. It, it might be. Certainly, you know, the Gen Z folks and above, you know, are, are looking at more than just, you know, I want to get a mass more material things. You know, they're wanting more out of work than that. They want purpose. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of them want flexibility. And one of the things that's happened in the pandemic, you know, I think that, that companies all over the world have learned is that they can accomplish quite a lot with remote work that, you know, people don't have to have these long, miserable commutes that just add you know, hours to their workload, but that they really can have a quality of life and get the work done. Yes. You know, at the same time. And we've certainly proven that. By the way, there's another book that I would really recommend that informed informed our move to a shorter work week. And it's a book called Shorter, and it's by Alex Pang, P-A-N-G. And he argues, creates all the science and everything. He wrote another book called Rest that has really informed my thinking on this topic, and he's become a good friend. But but he argues why shorter work hours actually lead to more productivity. And it, and it has to do with what we're talking about here, which is, you know, the incredible power of non-achievement and, you know, the, the, the fact that rest is the, is, is the foundation of meaningful work. I don't think it's by accident that when God, you know, in the Genesis account, when God creates the world, evening and morning were the first day. Mm -hmm. So that in the Hebrew model, the day actually begins with rest and ends with work, you know, sundown to sundown. And I, th I think it's just proof positive that, you know, you've got to have the foundation of rest if you're going to 
show up at the be- as the best version of yourself. That's so spot on. Do you think remote work is here to stay then? I, I, I do. Uh, I think that there are, you know, some people, some bosses that are still suspicious of it. You know, I think they, they come at it from a little bit of a old school, school scarcity <laughs> mentality. Yeah. That, you know, cause I've had, I've had people in our coaching program that said to me, but if I don't have people in the office, how will I know that they're getting the work done? I said, well, how do you know they're getting it done even if they're in the office? I mean, unless you're standing <laughs> yeah. behind them. <laughs> right. You know, or monitoring their screen in some way. How do you know? And I, and I think that, you know, that sort of the new approach is how about if we hold people accountable to results and we forget about how much time that their butt's in the seat? Oh. I mean, that's, that's my philosophy. I don't monitor that. I don't care. I, d- I do monitor it in that I don't want people spending too much time at work. So we monitor that pretty rigorously. Okay. But but if they spend too little time, I don't care. Get the job done. If you can get it done faster, great. How, how do you monitor? I'm curious. How do you monitor overwork then? And what do you do about it? Well, first of all, we kind of have a hard, fast rule uh, that um, no email or Slack messages after hours. So our official work hours are nine to three. And if it's an emergency, and and certainly you know you can't be legalistic about this because there there are going to be times when the ox falls in the ditch and you got to you know pull it out, and so you know we have protocols for that like text messages. You know if it's really urgent, if it's really an emergency, then text the people that are appropriate. Otherwise, we don't expect anybody to check Slack. We don't check, expect anybody to check email. Uh, we give and, and we do monitor that, and we and we check the health of our teams. And frankly, during this pandemic, when we went to a 30-hour work week, we had some teams that had no problem with it, some teams that really struggled with it. We had to work with them. We had recently an all-employee meeting where we had uh, a jam session where we said, okay, let's come up with all the hacks to get more work done in less time because we don't want anybody you know, working past 3 o'clock in the afternoon if we possibly can. And so we just, you know, we do employee surveys, all that kind of stuff just to make sure that we're you know, keeping a, keeping our, our finger on the pulse. Michaelhyatt.com slash careers, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I mean, gosh. Oh. You know, well, one of the things we do too, because we believe in this non-achievement time so much, we, we give everybody a paid 30-day sabbatical every three years. So that's an employee benefit. And uh, we've now, we're now on about our fourth year of those. And our team loves it. And the 30-hour work week, Chris, you can't imagine what that's done to our recruiting. Like we're hired a bunch of positions now. We've hired about 10 since the beginning of the first of the year. One of the last positions we hired was my daughter hired a chief of staff. She had over 400 applicants because people want that kind of lifestyle. Yep. And it's not that people don't want to produce. They actually want to do meaningful work. They, they absolutely do. So, you know, I, I mentioned our results over this last year. Uh, last year, we won the, the Inc. Best Places to Work Award. Yeah, you know, you we were did. one of several companies. Yeah. But they, they, when you do that, that survey for them, the way it works is you apply, and then they survey all your employees. And as the owners, we couldn't have any input. We didn't get to see the results of the surveys. Those were all mailed in from the employees directly to Inc. Magazine. So then they came back to us with, you know, they let us know that we won and they gave us this beautiful PDF document that had this infographic on all of our stats and results. Oh my gosh. They said like the average company, the average company in, in the U S has about a, a engagement rating of about 39%, which means that 61% of the time people are doing non-work at work. They're disengaged. You know, they're scrolling social media, they're chit-chatting about stuff that has nothing to do with work, whatever. Our engagement was 98.6%. I mean, it was like off the charts. They said, you guys are in like the 0.001 percentile. And and I really believe that it has to do with when you care for people and you really care Uh, for the totality of their life. Yeah. And when you give it meaningful work with a vision they believe in, they will be engaged. That's not something you have to monitor if you get it right. Mm. 
Diving into your routine now as, as founder and chairman, like how are you thinking about winning at your work and succeeding in your life now that you've stepped away from day-to-day -day responsibilities at the company? Like what's changed in how you're measuring success today then? Yeah, so um, when, when I contemplated this move for the first time, when I said three years ago, I said, you know, I really want to see this succession go well. And, and I want to do it because I, I've still got a lot of things I want to do. And I, I think, you know, we were getting questions like, you know, this, this brand has been built around my personality. What happens to me? So we wanted to depersonalize it a little bit. And so I started thinking about the succession. Well, initially, if I'm honest, it kind of scared me because I thought, what am I going to do with myself? I mean, so much of my identity, even though I'm self-aware enough to know that it shouldn't be, so much of my identity was built on my work, sure, right? Of course. So, so I, I caught myself this last summer sort of putting the brakes on a little bit and going, man, is this really what I want? And here's what changed everything. I asked this question. I said, if I turn over the company to Megan, my oldest daughter, and if I step down as the CEO, here was the magic question. What will that make possible for me? So instead of asking the question, what am I going to lose? I said, what is this going to make possible? And so then I just started. I literally wrote this out. I said, okay, first of all, it's going gonna, it's gonna to enable me to get even more focused in what I call the desire zone activities. I wrote about that in my book, Free to Focus. That's right, right. So the things that I'm passionate about, the things that I'm proficient at, I can get that even more dialed in. So I'm doing only the things that I truly love and the things that I'm really good at. So that was number one. Number two is it's going to free up all this time to pursue all these other interests that, frankly, up until now, I haven't had the time to do, you know, to get more serious about my hobbies, to uh, take on some other business interest outside of Michael Hyde and Company, which I've done. So that's, that's kind of how I was able to navigate that, you know, was to, to and, and again, I advise people when you're thinking about your vacation. You know, think about what you're going to do. Program that time. Don't just leave it a vacuum because nature abhors a vacuum and it will fill back in with work if you're not careful. Yeah, it was it was actually from you that I learned the principle of scheduling your time on paper first. Powerful. Mm. It's really powerful. Michael, what what do you know about my generation that we don't know that we need to know in light of this conversation? That's a great question. I, th I think that first on the positive, that you you know intuitively that work can't be everything. And I would just say, lean into that intuition and don't let anybody try to convince you that you need to put that on hold until, you know, just work your buns off now, make a lot of money. Someday you can retire and enjoy all this other stuff. Don't give into that. That's the hustle fallacy. And it's destructive. I was going to say it's detrimental, but it's more than detrimental. It's destructive. So lean into that. Um, I, you know, frankly, for your generation, I don't really have anything negative. I've got a, you know, I got a company full of people your age and they're amazing. Mm -hmm. You know, they're incredibly bright. I love the way that they're leaning into, you know, the social side of work and diversity and all those kinds of things. You know, all those are good impulses. And I think that many people in your generation saw people in my generation, you know, sacrificing everything on the altar of their ambition. Mm -hmm. And and that's been a cautionary tale for you. And and I think it's it's good. You know, I would just keep following your instincts and keep pursuing that work-life balance because it's absolutely possible. And by the way, this doesn't mean you have to give up on your professional ambition, right? Like I still have. You know, I, I love winning. I love winning at work. I love seeing my company scale. I love seeing it mm -hmm. get bigger. I love seeing it be more productive and touch more lives and impact more people. So I haven't given up on that. It's just that I, I keep it within mm -hmm. constraints. And the other side of this too, folks, is that, and Michael, you wrote about this in the book, is that we can actually pump the ambition breaks too hard. Spend some time on that. Yeah, so so it's it's like two ends of the spectrum. One is the hustle fallacy the other one is the ambition break. Now, the, the person that pumps the ambition break is the person who kind of looks down the corridor of, of the future and says, man, 
keep working like I'm working, and if I keep sacrificing everything for my work, this is not going to go well. It's not going to end up in a good place. So I'm going to pump the brakes on my ambition. I'm going to settle for less at work. And, you know, I'm, I'm just not going to pursue my career like maybe some of my, you know, peers. Mm-hmm. I'm willing to kind of fall behind and, and not maximize my potential for the sake of having more balance. See, I don't think it's either or. You know, I think it's possible that you could say, no, you know, I'm going to be uber competitive, but I'm not going to do it by working more. I'm going to do it by working smarter. So, so for me, you know, I've got three goals for the quarter. I've got, you know, three outcomes for this week that I want, and I've got my daily big three for today. And so if I, I know from personal experience and even theoretically that if I stay focused on that, if I stay focused on the weekly big three and then my quarterly big three, if I stay focused on that, I will accomplish amazing things. And it won't cost me, you know, 50, 60, 70, 80 hours a week. Not necessary. Because it's not more. It's really about being focused on the things that matter. One of the things I think about in light of this conversation is something that I learned from you I, probably 10 years ago by now. Um, and it was crafting a value proposition. Basically, I am this and I do this so yeah. that this, right? And so actually in show prep for this, I, I employed that and I went, oh, I'm going to have some fun with this. So if we were to construct a value prop that sounds like I win at work and I succeed at life, so that blank, what do you think comes after so that? Yeah, well, kind of go back to the stewardship thing, right? So part of our value proposition at Michael Hyde and Company is that the win at work and succeed at life is the transformation. It's the last part of that value proposition. But if you were to invert it, then I think, you know, it's, I'm going to win at work and succeed at life. So I can be a good and faithful steward. That's really what it comes down to, right? Like as Christ followers and nearly a hundred percent of people listening to us today follow Jesus. And so it's, it's easy to say this at the end of our lives, we're going to stand before the Lord. He's going to say, what have you done with what I've given you? And I want to hear well done. And I think that's what I hear you saying too. Totally. You know, if I've been a good steward and, and you know, I can give an account for myself and obviously not all of it's going to be perfect, for sure. And there's going to be probably areas that that we neglected that we didn't even know we neglected. Mm-hmm. Uh, but still, if we're faithful to that which the, the Lord brings to our awareness, faithful stewards over that, I think that's enough. Ah, so good. So good. Uh, Michael, is there anything frustrating that you're experiencing right now in light of this conversation, maybe even framed against what you've shared today? No, I get I get disturbed, Chris, from time to time when I when I watch my social media feel, feeds and I and I see people just bragging about how much they're working or how busy they are, and and I think I think there's coming a reaction to that. You know, I think the people that that advocate for that and and you know, one I name in the book, and I don't generally like to name names, but this has been a person that's been so vocal about this. And that's, uh, Elon Musk. Exactly. You know, and, and I know young entrepreneurs that look up to him and, and one of the things he, he argues for is working a hundred hours a week. And he says, if you do that, you'll be able to accomplish in four months what your competitors take, you know, a full year to do. And, and that violates everything we know from science about productivity, because once you get past about 55 hours a week, you actually go backwards in terms of productivity. That's what the science says. And the most productive people in history, and I'm talking about the Einsteins, the, you know, the, the artists, the, the people that have really accomplished amazing things that we still remember today. For most of those people, they're working about four to five hours a day because that's really all the kind of the juice you have. And, you know, you, one of the things you read about, you know, sort of of those artists and those scientists is they spend a lot of time rejuvenating, you know, a lot of time walking, a lot of times having some hobby painting, think of Winston Churchill, for example, even in the midst of world war two at the height of it, when London was being bombed, he still painted. Oh man. You know, I, I heard John Maxwell say this probably a month ago and I know he said it for decades, but the ability to identify our peak performance hours, you know, for him, I think he said it was 4am to 
9 a.m. or something like that, a, fi- a good five-hour chunk. I think that's a big breakthrough for a lot of people Yeah, is understanding what some people call your chronotype, you know, when you're at peak performance. And I used to think, I used to place a higher value on morning people, you know, that, that if you're really serious about productivity, you'd be a morning person. Mm-hmm. But let me tell you something. Not everybody's wired that way. Some people are the most productive in the evening. Some people of the day, some people early in the morning. And I'm an early morning guy. Me too. But- not everybody's that way. You know, it's funny. The other day I, I posted something on Instagram related to the podcast. And I, I told people, I said, here's the thing. I'm not a night owl. And it's true. I'm in bed every night before 10 o'clock, Michael. Me too. And I tell you, I think personally for me, one of the most, most, most important things I can do for my own psychological, emotional, spiritual, and physical well-being and it, there's a whole chapter in the book on this is make sure that I get eight hours rest yes, each sir. night. And I monitor that like a hawk. Like I got eight and a half hours last night, which was fantastic. <laughs> and sometimes I have to, you know, choose to sleep in yeah. a little bit more to get that. But it's it's honestly the most important thing I can do to do that is make sure I go to bed at the right time. And so for me, it's 845. So oh. I need to get to bed by 845. Brilliant. And and it's you know, it's it's harder than it looks sometimes. I agree. Michael, listen, your time, your wisdom is such a gift to me. Thank you for investing in me and uh, thanks for being here today. Guys, right now, go to wintoday.tv slash episode 241. Get a copy of Michael's brand new book. But Michael, I would love for you to land this plane. Is there anything else that we haven't covered today that you'd like to share with the listeners? Yeah, thank you so much. Well, I, I will say, first of all, if you want to buy the book, you can buy it from any retailer, Win at Work and Succeed at Life. But then if you go to this website, which is win, uh let me look at it here. Win sure. and succeed book.com forward slash win. Oh, cool. It's a page we've created just for your listeners. Thank you. And if you turn in your receipt from whatever retailer, there's over $500 worth of free bonuses related to the book. And, and again, those are free. So whether you pre-order it or you order it, I don't know when this is going to air, but, uh, but get the book, come back with the receipt and get those free bonuses because it'll help you to win at work and succeed a lot to actually put it into place. Wonderful. Michael, thank you. You're a gift. Thanks, Really appreciate you. You know, there really is no one like Michael Hyatt. As I said at the top of the show, it's the third time he's been here and each and every time he's added tremendous value to my life. And I trust he's done the same for you. So right now go to wintoday.tv slash episode 241. You'll find show notes and a link to purchase Michael's brand new book. In fact, I'm actually going to do a direct link there to winandsucceedbook.com slash win, as Michael just said, because when you go there, again, winandsucceedbook.com slash win, you're going to get a ton of bonus material when you get Michael's book. So do that right now. And hey, next week here on the show, I'm joined by Caitlin Crosby. She's the founder of The Giving Keys. We're talking about the power of words to change you from the inside out. I can't wait to share this one. Here is a preview. Think of all the good things it's going to produce in them, whether it's resilience and creativity Mm -hmm. and emotional depth and compassion and empathy and, um, and that knowing that, yeah, we can't control what happened, whether someone left us or we decided to leave because we were in an, you know, unhealthy situation, um, for ourselves or our our kids that, you know, uh, we can only do the best that we can do. And, at the, you know, from this point on, wherever you guys are, are I mean, it can really only get better from here. And also knowing that you maybe conquered a fear, like, for instance, for me, this was my worst nightmare. Um, and but now that I'm living in my worst nightmare, I'm like, oh, it's really not that bad. Like, uh, it, and it's kind of empowering to know that I can get through this. So you can get through this and it's it's only going to go up from here. And there's so much depth that we're even learning that maybe will make us more attractive to someone else in the future that we are, you know, someone we're better suited for. The power of words to change your life and a very raw, very vulnerable conversation with Caitlin Crosby right here next week on Win Today. Thanks again for joining the conversation this week right here on Win Today. I believe people just like you should be able to live successful, meaningful lives. And that's why I want to invite you to join the inner circle of readers on my email list who get weekly, well-researched self-improvement tips. So right now, go to wintoday.tv to sign up. It's absolutely free. And lastly, whether you're a new listener or have been listening to the show for a while, I'd really appreciate your rating and review of Win Today on the Apple Podcast app. 
So right now, will you write a short, honest review? Doing so helps expand the listenership of Win Today, and that would mean a ton to me. Thanks again for listening today. I hope you have an awesome week. We'll talk to you again really soon. Bye-bye.